So uh, let's, Igor, let's show them a, a video. I wanted to show you a quick video and I'm gonna explain what's going on. So these are people watching a plane fly over them. It's a fighter jet. Make it louder, Igor. There. And then this other jet flies over them. And I want you to pause the video in a second. So notice that jet just flies over them. Pause it right there. Do you guys see all those tents? Do you guys realize what happened there? That jet flew so closely to them that the, the blast that it created around them, the air blast, that all of the tents just came flying up like really high up. I'm sure none of us have ever been in a windstorm this powerful, right? Imagine, like obviously the sound in this video does not do the plane justice, right? The, the, the sound that it creates. In fact, we can turn the video off. We know that when a plane exceeds the sound barrier, it creates a sonic boom, right? Like this cone of, and, and of just of power of air. And it's so strong that if it's close enough, you know, and if it's flying by glass, just all the glass windows just start shattering. I mean, imagine how that would feel to your eardrum, right? You're just standing and just getting physically hit with a blast of air. Today we're going to be looking at Revelations 19. And we're going to be looking at the second coming of Christ. Open up your Bibles, guys. Please, all of you. Um, even if you did not intend to open your Bible, please open up and we'll just follow along verse by verse as we look at Revelations 19. But you know, when, when we think of the second coming of Christ, I don't want us to imagine it as something kind of calm and quiet that occurs. It's something more similar to, I'm not saying it's exactly like, but it's something more similar to one of these fighter jets just boom, entering the atmosphere and everyone, the whole world just shocked and aware of his presence. He is not coming quietly like we celebrated his first arrival in Bethlehem, right? We sing Silent Night because that was his first arrival. His second arrival will be nothing like his first arrival as we will see. So let's read together Revelations 19 and we'll start with verse 11. This is John saying, Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, that's crowns, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Guys, this is his second arrival, Christ's second coming. Hebrews 9.28, David already mentioned this verse. It says, so Christ, having offered once, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, it means the sacrifice he did, right, will appear a second time not to deal with sin. Jesus is not coming to forgive sin again, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. You see, Christ's second coming, guys, for some it will be <coughs> terrific. It will be good. For others, it will be terrifying. So let's go verse by verse. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened. And I'm going to come up a little closer. Heaven opened. Let me ask you this. 
when uh, there's other passages in the Bible when we hear about heaven opening, specifically in the Old Testament. Can anyone name what that time was? When did the heavens open up in the Old Testament? When the said book is up. Jesus' baptism, yes, that's the New Testament. How about the Old Testament? Genesis 7, 11. Very easy to remember, right? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the deep burst forth and the windows of heaven were opened. Right? That was during the flood. During the flood, the heavens were open, and the flood was the time when God brought judgment upon the entire world. And when the heavens will open up what again, Christ's second coming will be the day God has his second and final judgment upon the entire earth once again. In fact, guys, the idea of heaven opening up is it's actually very scary, right? Almost nothing good comes falls on us from heaven, right? Like, we barely tolerate rain, right? Like, we're, we're, we're okay with rain. It's a love-hate relationship. Like, we need it, right, for our earth. But anything else falling out of heaven is deadly, right? It, like, a little pebble can kill you. It's, we like our heavens and our skies clear, right? Just a, a clear sky, a, a, a beautiful sunset, and I'm good, right? Everything else coming out of heaven is terrifying, and Jesus will one day, will violently enter into this world. It's not just some F-16, right, that makes your bones shake. Not some man-made equipment, but the eternal Son of God coming to this world. Verse 11 says that he will come on a white horse. Thank you. He will come on a white horse. What is this a contrast to? Revelation is all a book of images and contrasts. It's a contrast to what, guys? The donkey. Jesus entering to Jerusalem on the donkey. The donkey is an image of humility, right? A symbol of peace. Whereas the horse is an image of power. It is authority of, of war, right? The horse was a weapon, a great weapon of war. It was a huge advantage in battle, and we might not, like as modern day 21st century people, we might not appreciate the power of a horse because maybe some of us even never rode on a horse. Has, has, so, who has never rode on a horse? I've never rode on a horse, right? But horses are big, right? Maybe I did ride. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't want to lie, so I'm going to say I don't know. They're big, right? They're, you know, like they can be really tall. Now imagine, you know, you're standing with your little, you know, swords, and then there's this huge horse plated with armor, and it's just charging at you, right? It's like there's no competition. You don't even need to, like, hit people. You just, you just run them over. It's like comparing, you know, people with just by foot soldiers and tanks. That's the, that's the equivalent, right? It was a huge advantage in battle. Guys, Jesus is not coming back again. I just want you to realize this. He is not coming back again gentle and lowly. Do you guys realize that? He's not. His arrival can be at any moment. He tells us to live in anticipation. And he is not coming back gentle and lowly. It's not going to be like, Hey guys, it's me, Jesus. Remember I came 2,000 years ago to you know, offer you guys salvation? I'm here to remind you, like, my offer still stands. Like, I know you've been rejecting me and pushing me away and all these things, and, but you know what? I just want to remind you one more time that, you know what? You can, you can still be saved. Like, you know, I know you, you completely deny me and you keep saying, not now, not now, but you know what? My offer still stands. That is not going to be the arrival of the second coming of Christ. He is not coming gentle and lowly, guys. We sometimes have this image of Jesus where he is completely, you know, harmless. He can, he can do nothing. He's just this fuzzy bunny, 
And he is gentle and lowly, and that is how he came into this world the first time. But that is not how he is coming again. He is not coming again to deal with sin. He is not coming again to bring forgiveness. He is coming on a weapon of war. And notice this word white. It gets repeated three times. What it means is he's, he's bringing justice and this justice is incorruptible. You can't bribe him. You can't slide him a Benjamin like, hey, let's, let's, it's okay, just pass this up, right? He's not going to play favorites either. Oh, but my parents were Christian or, you know, I did all these things for you. There's no favoritism with Jesus. There is only the delivery of pure justice. And that's what verse 11 says. Read with me. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus is faithful, he is true, his motives are always pure and right, and his judgment is good and right, and there is no corruption whatsoever. And verse 12, read with me, his eyes are like a flame of fire. Imagine looking into another person's eyes, not animal, person and their eyes are glowing. It's a flame of fire. That's scary, right? Because our eyes, when you look into our eyes, look in, into your neighbor's eyes right now. Just, I don't care if you know them or not, just look into their eyes. What's at the very center of their eyes? What color, guys? Black, right? Just like their soul, right? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It's black. Stay with me, guys. Stay with me. Stay with me. It's black because it's taking in light, right? But his eyes, they give off light. His own eyes create light for, their, for themselves. That means there is nothing hidden from his eyes. There is no dark corner that he can go to where his own eyes do not illuminate whatever it is that he is looking at. And it's not just talking about physical light. It's talking about spiritual darkness. There is nothing hidden from him. He is not ignorant of anything. And this confirms what Scripture also says, Hebrews 4.13, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So often, we are afraid you, know, you do something wrong and you're so afraid of other people finding out what you did, what I did, right? And we're so afraid of that. But the one we should fear is the one who has eyes of flaming fire. The one who sees and knows all of it already because there is no hiding from him. His light will give away all of our secrets. Just with one look, one gaze, you will know that you are fully exposed it's like an x-ray, like you cannot hide anything from him. And it says, on his head are many diadems, basically a big, really fancy crown. He is, he's not just coming on, you know, he's just not just coming with power, he is coming with actual authority that has been given to him by God. He's coming back with royal power and prestige. Read with me, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. What an interesting phrase. What does that mean? Well, what's the point of a name that nobody knows except your own self? Like, isn't a name for everyone else to use to reference to you? You know what this tells us? That our God, Jesus Christ, He is incomprehensible. Not in the sense that there is nothing we can know about Him, but in the sense that we can never fully grasp Him he is the Jesus Christ that came to earth. He is the great king that is coming back and going to bring justice and judgment upon this world. But he is also so much more. He is so great. His name is so incomprehensible that even the greatest, most trusted angels in heaven do not even know that name. Not that, it, not that he's being sneaky or secretive, but, because, but he is so deep and so complex that we will spend all of eternity growing and growing and growing in our knowledge of God and never actually fully finding the edge of Him. 
That's the God we worship. The incomprehensible, almighty, royal power God. That's amazing. Verse 13, read with me. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Now some think it's talking about his blood. Maybe it is. But others will argue that it's talking about the blood of his enemies. Because if you read the context, verse 15, after that says, says, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Now, do you guys know how my, wine was made back in ancient days? They'd get a bunch, bunch of the grapes and they'd put them into a large container. Just think like, I don't know, like a pool, right? Like a little pool. And they just stack a bunch of grapes. And they'd have people stomp on the grapes and the juice would come down, it would flow out, and they would have jars, and they would capture the juice in order to make the wine. So it's this image of these grapes being crushed and the liquid coming out and pouring out from the bottom, right? Revelation 14, verse 19, speaking of this says, So the angel swung his axe across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God, you guys, it sounds familiar, right? And the wine press was trodden, meaning walked upon, crushed, outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle. This image of the wicked being placed into this place, crushed, literally just stomped, crushed, and so much blood flowed out into the valley that the whole valley fills with blood as high as a horse's bridle. You know, where the part where they put the thing into the horse's mouth? That's how much blood there will be, right? Again, this is just an image, but the point is, if you're thinking, man, this is like PG-13 kind of stuff, like rated R, like gory, like that's a little intense. I'm glad you're realizing that is literally the point of this passage is to be gory. I'm sure that if in first century, when John had this vision, if they had meat grinders, they, he probably used this image, right? The meat grinder of the fury of the wrath of God. Because that shows how angry God is with sin. He wants to crush all evil. And there will be a bloody mess from it. Guys, we have to realize that we, in this moment, right now, you're just sitting here, breathing in this room. You're alive. At this moment, we have not received the wrath of God that we have deserved, that we have earned over the entirety of our lives. We have not. Like, we're almost like an escapee, right, from justice. Like, you're, you're running from justice. You've committed a crime and you're running from justice. Justice has not been served upon us. And truly, our eyes, our, our, our sin is evil in the eyes of God. But we are so deeply immersed into it that we don't even realize how evil our sin is. A good analogy is like fish, right? Fish are born into water. They live in water. They die in water. Their, their entire life they spend in water so they don't even understand the concept of wetness, right? Like you can explain it to the fish like, hey, you're wet. Like you're wet your entire life. It's like, what is wet? What is water, right? Like what is water? They don't even know. They don't understand because they're so immersed into it. As it's the same thing with us in sin. Scripture says that in sin did my mother conceive me. We're born into sin. We live in sin. We die in sin. We're so surrounded by sin. I remember uh, my wife's, when we got married, my wife's car was older. And her dad got it for her. And I don't know if it was like the previous owner or her dad, but... Um, you, got them, you guys know the steering wheel covers? You know, there's like steering wheel, you can buy a special one, whatever, one of the stores. And there's like the leather kind, but then there's like the cloth kind, the softer kind. It's not as cold in the winter. Well, she had a cloth kind, and it was like old. I, I don't think she put it on, but the point is, it was old, 
and you know, she just never questioned it. You know, just something's given to you, you never question it, and you live your whole life with it. And then she gets pregnant with our first kid. And I don't know, if for, the, for those of you that might not know, but for many women, when they get pregnant, their sense of smell just like goes through the roof, right? And she like comes to me one day and she's like, man, something stinks in my car, you know? No, go, go like try to smell it, like check it out, you know? So she's like, you know, comes in, she's like, and it comes back, she's like, it's the steering wheel cover, it's disgusting. You know, it's, it's like dusty, this and that. So I walk in, I sit down, like, like, I can't really smell it, right? But then I put my nose like really close to it. I'm like, yeah, that's dusty, it's nasty, right? So I take that whole thing off, I throw it away into the trash. But it's crazy because she spent years, right? Years driving in this car. It was always just as dusty, even before the pregnancy. Never noticed. I never noticed. You probably would have never noticed. But that doesn't mean it wasn't dusty. She only realized that it was dusty after her sense of smell was uh, increased. Now, if you think that's impressive, and it is impressive. I had a guy recently tell me, he's like, yeah, we found out we were pregnant again because um, my wife said the tree, my Christmas, the Christmas tree smelled different. <laughs> it's like, hold on, take a test. <laughs> they take a test and yes, lo and behold, she was pregnant. So, it's impressive. But, you guys know, so imagine we get a, we get a cup of coffee, we get a teaspoon of sugar, put it in, mix it in. Would you be able to smell the sugar in the coffee? Probably not, right? Probably not. Maybe a pregnant woman would, right? Okay. A dog can smell the teaspoon of sugar, but not just in a cup, not just in a gallon or a hundred gallons or a thousand gallons. The dog can smell a teaspoon of sugar if you put it into two Olympic-sized lap pools. Guys, just think about that. That's bigger than this room. Two Olympic-sized lap pools. You just one teaspoon of sugar, and it can pick up the scent of sugar. Because their sense of smell is a hundred, not a hundred, not a thousand, a hundred thousand times stronger than the average human smell. Not a hundred, not a thousand, a hundred times a thousand, a hundred thousand times stronger. Just think about how crazy that is. In fact, bears have a very similar sense of smell. The way they catch fish is actually not by seeing them and grabbing them. They smell them coming and they grab them out of the water. Bears will smell things from 13 miles away and go find food. Guys, and that's just animals. This is just animals with that sort of sensitivity. Why do I bring this all up? My only point is that whatever we consider as normal, normal, right, could be actually very, very far from normal. You know, most people, we shower every day, right? And no matter how sweaty you consider yourself to be, how stinky or whatever, right, after about an hour, of taking a shower, most of us would say we probably don't stink, right? Especially use deodorant, like probably after an hour, I'm still safe, right? I'm safe. <laughs> like I don't have to like run back to the shower again before meeting people. Okay, yeah, we probably are safe. But for a dog whose sense of smell is a hundred thousand times stronger than a human being, it doesn't matter how many times you've washed. It doesn't matter how long you've washed for, it can smell you and your stench through and through from a mile away. It can smell your insides and everything. It doesn't matter when you washed. And again, guys, that's just an animal. Connecting it back to sin. We are sensitive to our sin. You know, when we do something wrong, we, we feel bad about that, right? Like, ah, probably shouldn't have done that, probably shouldn't have said that. Whenever someone sins against us, we get angry, right? But imagine how much more sensitive God is to our sin. 
not just another animal, but the almighty creator. Imagine with what, what kind of sharpness and how aware he is of the wickedness of every single sin. He is not a fish who was born in water. He is above sin, so he sees it very clearly. He's not just, he doesn't have the smell of a dog. He has infinite smell, and he can see it exactly for what it is. And for what for us might seem as just some sort of like, you know, yeah, that was kind of bad. That was kind of wrong. Probably shouldn't do better next time. For us, that in God's eyes is horrible. It is a stench like no other. Guys, this is true. You know, what makes bad breath tricky? What makes bad breath tricky? Everyone's like super self-conscious right now. Like, well, what makes it tricky? The person that has bad breath usually can't smell their own bad breath. Like you might have hints that it's bad, but you don't experience it the way your friend does, right? <laughs> when you're talking to them. That's the tricky part. Because if a person could smell their own bad breath, they would have done something about it long ago. Guys, our sin is the same exact way. We think, ah, big deal. But actually our sin is disgusting in the eyes of God. And one day God promises that he will get rid of all stenches in this world. He will get rid of all sources of sin. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. But the one thing I want us to walk away from is the realization that we do not see our sin for what it really is. But one day God will do the right thing. Going on, verse 13, read with me. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Jesus is the full revelation of God. The same John that wrote Revelations is though the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, where it says in John 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus, the Word of God. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Jesus is not coming back alone. He is coming back with an entire army, with troops. And all of them are pure and just and righteous. And, and they're all on horses, right? It's not just like one F-16. It's not 10 F-16s. It's, it's millions and billions of them all coming after all the wicked. The ground will be rumbling. The windows will be smashing it will be truly a terrifying sight. Verse 15, read, we read with me, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. All he needs as his main weapon is his mouth. Think about how, like what kind of power that is. All he needs is his mouth. Like he, his hands are in his pockets, right? He just needs to speak and that's it. It's funny because the tongue is like the softest, one of the softest parts of our body, right? It's got, it doesn't have a bone. There's no bone. Like you, you can't hit someone with your tongue, right? And, and actually hurt them. But Jesus, in his glorified state, he has a sharp sword. Instead of a soft tongue, a sharp sword. And again, this confirms what Scripture says, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. I'll just read it for you. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's talking about the Antichrist, whom the Lord Jesus will slay or kill with the breath of his mouth. That's it. He just shows up. He just says the word, and he destroys the greatest enemy. That's savage, guys. That is powerful. Verse 15, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. We've already talked about this. He's going to crush all wickedness. Verse 16, And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here is the great king. Here is the great Lord, the one to whom all other kings, to the one to whom all other powerful people in the world all bow before him. Everyone else is limited in some shape or form. 
Jesus is not limited in any way, shape, or form. He is the greatest. There is no one stronger than him. Now, I want to share a verse from the Old Testament. And if you've been like spacing out, guys, if you've been spacing out, just pay attention to this one verse, please, okay? Promise? You guys promise? All right. Psalm 7, verse 12 says, If a man does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. Guys, that should send goosebumps, shivers down our spine. Psalm 7, verse 12 is basically a shorter version of Revelation 12. Yes, God is love. God is the God of second chances. Yes, God has sent His Son to die for our sins. But for those who do not accept the Son of God, for those who do not repent, look at God's position towards those. It is the position of a warrior who is ready to kill it's true. God has sharpened his sword. Modern day, he's loaded his gun. He's chambered a bullet. He's ready. He's ready. He is in, he, it's just one, he's one action away from killing the wicked one. He is one action away from killing the unrepentant one. And it says he has bent and readied his bow. He's ready. All he has to do is just let go. And the person will die. Meaning, he's got, he's aiming the gun at the head. He's got his finger resting on the trigger and he's not going to mess. Guys, this is, if we do not repent, this is God's position towards us. In our unrepentant state, God and his goodness as a good judge, he is a threat to us. He is a terror to us, guys. And God is committed to carrying out complete justice. And the problem is we are standing in the way of this justice. Guys, I'm not trying to manipulate you with fear or trying to you know, make things more colorful than they are. I, I'm, I'm doing a poor job of making it as colorful as it should be, as the Bible communicates it to be. God is furious with sin and Jesus is coming back not to pay for sins again but to remove all sin and to bring judgment again our sin might not seem like a big deal to us but to God it is a foul stench it is worse than a rotting corpse God sees our sin for what it really is and now let's finish by going through Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. So go to the next chapter. Read with me. Revelation 20, verse 11. <clears throat> After Jesus comes back, there's going to be this scene right here. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. You see, whether we live until the day that Jesus comes back, or we are raised on that last day, all of us will stand before the great throne of God. This is the supreme court of supreme courts, the highest form of judgment. It's a white throne because it means that there it's symbolic of no corruption. There's no favorites. There's no bribery. There's no backdoors. There's no, no deals. It is true. It is right. It is pure. There are no shortcuts, no exceptions. And it says, go, goes on to say, from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. Meaning, guys, we will all stand before this judgment and there is nowhere to hide from this judgment. There's nowhere to hide. Nowhere. Everything one day in heaven on earth will be exposed before the one who sees all things. If you commit murder today, in one country, you can actually flee to another country, depending on the country, but you can flee to another country, and you, you can get away with murder because that country where you committed the murder has no jurisdiction over this other country, 
And the murder was not committed in this country, so this country has nothing to put you on trial for. You can run away from human justice here on earth. But in the grand scheme of things, we cannot escape the justice of God. That is the place where everything truly will be fully balanced. There is no place to hide. There are no loopholes. There's no higher authority to appeal to. We can't run or hide from God. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Again, everyone will stand. Whether you're the president of the United States of America or you're a minimum wage worker your entire life, all of us will be equally standing before God one day. No exceptions. And verse 12, And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And I'm going to talk about this very soon. Verse 12, And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Notice this phrase, according to what they had done. These books that God has and will bring out on the last day, they have a record according to all that every single one of us has done. And we will be judged by those works. Meaning it is a fair trial. People today could commit a crime, they could frame you and you could be judged for their actions, which you did not do. Or you could do something, run away and hide, and you won't be judged for what you did. But on that last day, we will be judged according to what we actually did. We will all answer for our own actions and decisions. And here's the crazy part. God has a recording of all of it. Even if we can no longer remember, God has a recording. And the word book, they used the book because that was the only way of recording information back in the day. I mean, today we've got other ways of recording information, right? Video, we're going to have super HD, 3D videos. God has even more than that of our entire life. And he's got every single action, every single sin, cataloged, numbered, everything meticulously recorded. Everything. Down to the smallest detail. And we will have to give an account for every single deed and every single word. Every single one of them. I'm certain that if we were to get a compilation, today's the last day of the year, right? December 31st. Imagine if we had this thing at the retreat, like, hey guys, come by. We got a recording of every bad thing that you did just this year. Just this year. And we randomly pick a lottery with everybody's names in here and we pull it out and we read it and it's your name and we're just going to watch this video real quick okay so guys turn your attention to the screen and we watch a recording I mean I probably would just die from embarrassment like literally just I don't know die from embarrassment just in front of you guys, right? And you're other sinners just like me. And yet it's, it's embarrassing. But one day, guys, I know this idea, it sounds silly, right? We're never going to do that. But it'll actually happen one day. And it won't happen for the year of 2023, but it'll happen for every single year that you lived. And one day you will watch your entire life and not just by yourself. Imagine reviewing your entire life before the perfect being who has never sinned before the entire universe, step by step, action by action, and trying to explain every single set. Why did you do this one? Why did you do this one? Why did you do this one? And here's the key verse, guys. Verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So this book of life is very special because those whose name is not written in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire, the place of judgment. Here's the key. We are judged according to the book according to what we have done. 
But the only way people are going to be in heaven and avoiding the lake of fire and punishment is not by what was written in the books and according to what we have done, but if my name was written in the book of life. What does that tell us? That tells us, guys, that we are not saved by our deeds. We cannot. Because if we are judged only by what we did, we're just going to be in the lake of fire. The only thing we can determine based on our deeds is how hot the part of hell will be where we are going to be cast into. That's the only thing we can do. We can only determine the degrees of punishment with our actions. But we can never find eternal life. And notice, the only way to be saved is to have our name written in the book of life. Notice it says name. It doesn't say those whose deeds were written in the book of life, but name. That's all you need is your name, your soul, written in the book of life. And Revelation 21, 27 calls this book of life a different way. It says it is the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb's, that's Jesus Christ. You see, the Lamb in the Old Testament, was the animal that was sacrificed for sin. Now, for those of you that might not know, lamb is just a baby sheep. It's not like a different kind of animal. It's just a baby sheep, right? And sheep, they are innocent creatures. They, they don't have any way of even defending themselves physically. They don't have horns. They, they, they can do nothing. They don't have claws. They must be protected by a, someone else. They're innocent you can stand and be shearing them and you cut them and they'll just stand there and they're literally, they'll literally just cry. They're innocent animals. And a lamb is a baby sheep and baby sheep, they're even more innocent, right? And that's the image that God gives us, that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the only way to be saved is to have your name written in this Lamb's book of life. The only way to be saved is to have this innocent Lamb, the innocent Jesus, take away your sin, take away my sin. And guys, this is literally the gospel. We can only stand before the great white throne of God's judgment if we trust in Jesus' sacrifice on my behalf. That's it, guys. That's the only way we can be saved. The Lamb's blood covers all of our sin and cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness. He takes our place in the judgment and now we have His righteousness. And now when we come and we stand before the great white throne and the book that describes my entire life is opened up and that whole video is played before all to see, when all of my sins are exposed, before God, before the universe, before all of you. I will have Jesus standing by my side as my advocate, holding my hand because he loves me and I am his. And every single sin that comes up, he's going to say, I paid for that one too. I paid for that one too. And that one, and the one after, and that one, that one, all the way to the very last one, and I will not stand condemned. Because at the end of my trial, after Jesus is done defending me, God will say, on the basis of the righteousness of the Lamb of God, I declare you not guilty on all charges not guilty. You can walk away free into eternal life. You see, only by faith, that word faith, sometimes it doesn't make sense to all of us, by trusting in Jesus can we ever hope to withstand the trial of Christ. Are you trusting Jesus with your life? 
that he will stand there and advocate for you and he will take care of you on the great day of judgment. Are you trusting him? Only with Jesus by your side. So, I want to call the band up. But guys, New Year's. New Year's. We're going into 2024. We've got 12 hours exactly left. New Year's is a gift from God. In the sense that it is a time for us to reflect, to think. New Year's is a gift from God, a time for me to think back to my past year. Guys, do that today. Think back to your life. Think about your future. Where is my life headed? Is my life headed where it should be headed? Is it going there where it, where it should be going? And as you spend this day thinking about this year, the next year of your life, the question of utmost importance that you have to figure out in your heart is, do you have Jesus by your side? Because if he's not by your side now, he's not going to be by your side on the day of judgment. Do you have him by your side are you trusting in Him? Does your life belong to Him? If not, trust in Him. Ask Him to be by your side. And guys, I urge you, do not start this new year without Jesus. Don't do it. You don't know what this next year holds. And I'm not just trying to scare you. It's true. We don't know what this next year holds. That's the nature of life. It's a mystery. Don't start this year without Jesus. Go talk to him. Pray. Think about your life. If you want to talk to one of us, the leaders, we'd love to stay and talk with you. Trust in him. And if your life does belong to Jesus, and if you're sitting here and you have the assurance that you already know that Jesus will be here by your side. Guys, I just want you to appreciate the gift that you already have. Rejoice. Thank Him. Worship Him. That we will no, not have to be condemned on that last day. That He is with yes. us. That He loves us. So worship Him. Praise Him. And His great and infinite salvation. Amen. Let's stand, pray, and we will worship our Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great sacrifice that you have done. We thank you that we do not need to face your wrath, which we so deserve. We don't deserve your grace, but we accept it willingly, Lord. May we rejoice in you, thank you, love you, worship you, Lord. And I pray for anyone who has not yet made peace with you, that they would make peace with you. And they would not start this year, this next year, without you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.